Are you ready to take your first steps towards financial freedom by investing in property? Maybe you've started your portfolio but need some help continuing to grow. Lachlan Vidler and the team at Atlas Property Group are here to help. As experts in property investment, Lachlan and his team are ready to help you take advantage of some of the best investing conditions in almost 20 years. By completing the research, sourcing and negotiations, Lachlan goes the extra mile to find you a high-performing investment and set you on your path to financial freedom. Book in your free discovery call today at atlaspropertygroup.com.au. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Hello, everyone. Grace Omsby here. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. This show is all about investors, people's buying and selling journeys, their property portfolios over many, many years. And one of my favorite parts about this show, actually, it might be a bit of a surprising one to some people, is when we actually get to talk to people who we've talked to previously and continue following on that adventure and that journey that they're going on with their own property portfolio. Because it's safe to say that, you know, as seasoned and expert as you can be in the investor space, you still are going to be learning new things. Um, you're going to be encountering new experiences. Everything's changing, and especially when there's so many political pressures on what's going on at the moment. We've seen stimulus. We've seen the pandemic. There's always things that we can be learning from these investors, and that's why it's an absolute pleasure for me to be welcoming back a guest that I had on the show back in September 2020. 2020. Oh, my gosh, that feels so long ago now. Ashwarya Kesawani, welcome to the show. Thanks, Grace. Uh, great to be back on the show again. I can't believe, you know, that 18 months since you were on the show, for everyone who is listening along, that episode was how this 24-year-old could make 250 k plus from his first property. Like 18 months ago feels like such a long time ago, but also really in the scheme of things, it's not that long at all, is it? Yeah, it still feels like yesterday when I was back on the show, but um, yeah, in that 18 months, a lot has happened. And as you know, that's what I would be discussing today. Which I can't wait to unpack all this. But Ash, at that time, when you did come on the show, you were you were contemplating that sale of your first property and it made it to the title, which was how this 24-year-old could make 250 k from his first property. You're obviously not 24 anymore. That would be quite weird. Um, <laughs> did you manage to make the 250 k though? Uh, not exactly 250, a bit lower than that. But, um, you know, I did want to sell it at that time to move on to the next property. So, yeah, not exactly what the headline suggested, but yeah, got, got close to it, I would say. Yeah. Which is a pretty awesome result from your first property. Um, it was a flip. You, you renovated the whole thing. Just yeah. For everyone who hasn't listened to that episode or it's been a very long time since they have. Can you just give us a recap of that first, you know, when you bought that property? Because that was in the throes of the pandemic as well, pretty early on there. Yeah. So I bought that property in April 2020 when the first wave of COVID hit and yeah, people didn't really know what COVID might bring in the future. So I bought that property in Granville for about 6.30 and that property wasn't habitable. And in about a space of four months, I renovated the property and within six months, I had that sold. Which is crazy. Yeah. A crazy timeline, especially for everyone who has maybe doesn't quite remember. April was when we were starting to see yeah. the effects of the pandemic on the marketplace, the property market. While there were predictions of 30% drops, we didn't quite see it hitting that. But there was definitely a down. T- you, you pretty much picked the perfect time, even though you wouldn't have known that without hindsight, Ash. Yeah, that's right. Um, I believe in April, uh, when I saw the market was cooling off, uh, it was more of a flash crash uh, instead of a steady decline. So, um, but you know, I believed in the market that in the long term, you know, it's only up and up from here. So, um, I didn't time the market or anything. I, I guess, you know, I was lucky to be there at, at the right time. So, Ash, talk us through you, you then just after September, you went on and sold that first property made almost $250,000 and I believe that you used this money to fund your next purchase. Uh, yeah, that's right. So once I knew that I had already capitalized on the first property and I couldn't really get more out of it, 
I wanted to, you know, uh, crystallize my profits from that property and then use it to leverage into the second property. So uh, yeah, funny story. As two days after I sold my first property, I got into my second property. So it was very, very quick transaction. Yeah. Wait, so you you actually, you know, sold it, finalized that purchase and then found one two days later? Yeah. So, um, I mean, when the settlement happened, so it was two days after my settlement that I got another property through auction on the Saturday. Yeah. Wow. So you were ready and you had the money waiting. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I had my, uh, you know, pre-approvals and everything in place. So I knew exactly uh, how much I could spend and what the budget is. And I knew the type of location that I'd be looking at. So all it needed was the funds from the settlements to hit the account and then I could buy the second property. We're going to get a little bit more into that second property in a second. But before we do, for that financing on that second property and, you know, being armed and ready to go, pre-approval, obviously, very, very important there. How much of the money from the the sale of the first property did you decide you were going to sink into a second one? You know, was it all of that money or did you portion it out? Yeah. So I had about 80% uh, of the proceeds from the first property going to the second property. I kept 20% with me so I can use that to renovate the property again. So I always kept that 20% buffer. Very smart thinking there. How much help? Like, did you have any help for this process? Uh, no financial advisors or brokers. I uh, just went directly to my local bank and I had a good relationship with them anyway for the first property. So they were quite quick with the pre-approval process. Yeah, it was quite, quite smooth. Yeah. All right. Let's get to that second property now. Talk us through where it was and what it looked like when you got your hands on it. Yep. So when I was looking for the second property, all I wanted to do was go as possible, uh, go as far east as possible to the city. So I came across the suburb of Beverly Hills, which I hadn't even heard before. And, you know, geographically, it's located within 15 kilometers of the CBD and only a seven minutes drive to, to the beach. So it's a very strong capital growth market, Beverly Hills. And being so close to city, you know, I believe in, in the future, it will be quite in demand and even from a rental point of view. So um, the property that I looked at was uh, basically entry level to get into the Beverly Hills market. And um, as with me always, that property needed quite a bit of renovation. It wasn't really habitable. Uh, it needed a new kitchen, bathroom, and um, yeah, a lot of stuff just to make the house livable. Uh, yeah, that's roughly what the property was. Just to give some more context to that, you wanted to go further east. First property was out in, was it? Granville. Granville, Granville yeah. yeah. So that would have been a pretty sizable jump east. Is that a strategy that you want to continue, you know, moving closer to the CBD? No, not in the future. So mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, I want to, in the future, I want to diversify my portfolio. I've already got that property in Beverly Hills now, which is, you know, considered blue chip Sydney suburb. And now I want to move out to the West and, you know, look for high yield properties in the future. Very cool. We're going to take a quick break there. We'll be back soon with more from Ashwarya Kasawani. Looking for a blue chip Gold Coast investment property or trying to relocate to the beautiful sunny Gold Coast but keep missing out on the right properties? Maybe you need an expert on the ground to source the right property for you. The Srama Group are the leading recommended buyers agency specific to the Gold Coast, providing their clients with exclusive off-market property opportunities, specific insights into market, combined with a large network of dedicated professionals to ensure sure you make the right decision without the hassle. Get in touch with us at thesramagroup.com.au and secure your financial freedom today. Welcome back to this very special episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm very excited because I'm talking with someone who I previously talked to 18 months. A lot can happen in that time period as I'm finding out. Ash, before the break, you were talking about selling that first property and you were in the midst of trying to get that ready for sale last time we did chat. Since then, you've sold it. You've continued to pursue a property investment portfolio and it's clearly paying off, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there because we're still talking about that second property. You bought in Beverly Hills. Talk us through the specifics of that, obviously entry level, but how many bedrooms or did yeah. that really not, I guess, talk us through that because actually it'd be good to hear what the specs were originally and then what you, what you did in that renovation. Yeah. So the property is heritage listed. And this is why, you know, the attractive price when I bought it. 
the, the land size is quite big for Beverly Hills. Usually in Beverly Hills, you get around 450 square meters, but this property was actually 632. So quite a sizable block. The property on that is from 1899 and uh, about two and a half, two bedrooms, two bathrooms. Uh, originally, there was only one bathroom and then, you know, I've renovated that and got the second bathroom in there. Yeah, as I say, the property had good good bones. So all it needed was basically a cosmetic renovation and some uplift. And yeah, since it's heritage listed, there's a lot of going back and forth with the council uh, just to make sure that, you know, we don't change aspects of the building that contribute to the streetscape because the main, I guess, motive of council is to make sure those heritage properties, they don't really lose the street appeal. So there was a lot of uh, liaising with the council back and forth to make sure the colors that we use um, exterior and the finishes that we use are really consistent with the time period when the property was built. Mm. You talk about street appeal and I'm guessing considering it was a bit uninhabitable before you moved in, you did nothing but improve yeah. what it looked like from the street. How was that process? Because it's a pretty big jump, one, from just doing renovations in the first place to then having to deal with all these rules and regulations when you're dealing with heritage listed buildings. And for a lot of people, that's too much of a turn off. They're not even going to go there. Yeah. And that's where the opportunity is when, you know, people run away from the property. That means obviously there's not going to be as much competition when you're buying those sort of properties. And that's why I choose to, you know, pick properties that require renovation because it, the market pool that are interested in that property is already smaller. So, it, you know, when I went about renovating that property, and, you know, preserving the street appeal, I compiled photos from 1950s and 70s just to see how that property actually looked back in the day. And then I prepared a proposal that, you know, basically outlined that we are not, we are not going to make this property look any worse. And uh, we will try and make it as original as possible. And, um, you know, from there, I just submitted to the council and that was luckily approved. That's amazing. I feel I need to see these photos, Ash. You'll have to send them across. Yeah, I'll send it through. Yeah. And we'll we'll try and actually put them up with the episode because super interesting process. And as I said before, so many investors will not go down that route. But for you, has it been a fruitful exercise? What's happened since you've done the renovations? Because just thinking on that timeline, would have been towards the end of 2020 that yeah. you kicked off the renovations? Yeah, so I kicked off the renovation. The settlement happened in December 2020, and I started you know, working literally the next day on that. We were able to complete all the work by end of February, and that was perfect timing anyway, because in the last 12 months, as you know, Sydney went up 25 30%. So similarly in the Beverly Hills area as well, when I bought the property, the median price of a house in Beverly Hills was $1 million, and now it's $1.55. So it's really, uh, you know, taking a substantial growth in that area. And I've rented the property out for about more than about a year now. Yeah. Okay. So what did you buy the property for, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah. So I bought it for 890. So that was yeah. below median value. And what's yeah. the value at now? So when I bought it, it was 890 and now the median is about 1.5. So, and it's fully renovated. So I would say, you know, 1.4 to 1.6. Yeah. And how much had you spent on that renovation? So it was actually cheaper than the Granville renovation, just because the extent of it uh, was, you know, was not as detailed as Granville. So it was only about forty five thousand that I spent on the Beverly Hills property, which is nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you pretty much at least you know increased that by what around four four hundred four hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's incredible work, Ash, and that must be a relief to have done it. You know. To have done it once and it worked and then to have done it a second time and it be working. <laughs> yeah, like it's, I see it just as a process that, you know, if you if you follow these steps or uh, if you look for consistently properties under market value where you can, you know, capitalize and, as you say, manufacture equity. So that's the kind of strategy I'm going for at the moment. Here's a question for you, and I don't know if we will end up touching on this again later in the episode, but with the amount that prices have risen, in Sydney over the last 12 months. Do you think there's still potential for people to make the kind of purchases that you have so under market value? I think definitely with, you know, a hot market like it is today, it is harder to buy, uh, you know, properties under market value just because of uh, so much competition. 
Uh, so yeah, it would be it would be difficult again to buy you know properties like that. That's why I'm trying to diversify, go out west um, again where the competition could be lower. Yeah, and you're renting that place out. What are you now renting it out for? I'm renting that out for six hundred. Another rent rate is coming up in two months. Uh, two months. Yeah. Okay. So are you positively geared on that property? How's the yeah. cash flow looking? So I was positively geared from day one when I rented out that property just because of my low cost base and the high rents in the Beverly Hills market. So yeah, it's been positive from the start. And so when that money that you took out, you put 80% towards that property from the yep. from the proceeds from the last sale and you had 20% left, have you used up that full 20%? Did you use that whole thing on that renovation or you, have you still got some left over? So when I finished by renovating the place, I still had you know, about, I think, 10, 15 grand left over. But yeah, I didn't go over budget or, or anything like that. So yeah, I still had that money left over and uh, I used it for my other investments. So yeah. Last time we chatted, there were a few mistakes that you felt you'd made through mm. the process of renovating the Granville home. How do those lessons hold you in good stead for the Beverly Hills property? Yeah, I think the main lesson that I improved on from the first property to second, and that's probably why it cost me less to renovate the second property, was understanding the sequence of work. You know, that shower screen goes in after the tile is finished, so things like that. So, yeah, I actually wrote down quite a bit of points that I should probably improve on from the first property, and I tried to implement that into the second. So, sequence of work, you know, managing trades making sure you source the material at a competitive rate. So all of these things actually add up to your cost base. So yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of lessons from the first one. And so how long was that process in the end of renovating that before you could get the tenants in there? Yeah, about about two months, two and a half months. Pretty quick um, you know, turnaround. Pretty quick, yeah, compared to the first one, it was about four months. But yeah, as I said, uh, you know, for the second property, I had everything lined up, you know, back to back that, you know, this trade goes in first and the second and, you know, the material gets delivered on time and things like that. So because of that, we rarely had days where nothing was happening. So every day I tried to make sure that we have some sort of progress. And that's probably why we were able to do it in half the time. Did you do any of the work yourself? Yeah. So, uh, you know, whatever I could do, uh, I did because, yeah, obviously save money that way. But um, yeah, I did a lot of landscaping work myself. Uh, you know, a bit of painting here and there just to, you know, minimize the painter's worth. Yeah. So yeah, basically landscaping, a bit of, you know, concreting in the backyard. And that really helps because like I'm a civil engineer um, as a background. So, you know, getting involved with those things and materials, I, I really enjoy that. Mm. So you're still working full time while you're doing all this? Yeah, I'm working full time. Yeah. So uh, I usually try and get the renovation stuff after my, you know, work hours after five o'clock. Um, and, you know, just liaise with the trades and whoever's on site. Some pretty long days there then, I'm guessing, Ash. Yeah, yeah. I've got to work after this uh, interview as well. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it never stops, does it? But I'm no. guessing that's on, you know, there's still more of this story to be telling, even though this is an 18-month catch-up that we're doing, basically. There's still, there's still more going on with your property investment portfolio at the moment. So we're going to take another quick break there. We'll be back soon to find out what you're up to now. The mark of financial success isn't about getting bigger, better, faster, or more. To Paul, success is freedom. Freedom to spend more time with his family or giving back to his community or just more time to go surfing. Paul Glossop, an award-winning property buyer and regular guest on the Smart Property Investment Podcast, has taken the lessons he's learned building a multi-million dollar property portfolio and laid them out in his best-selling book, A Surfer's Guide to Property Investing. For a limited time, get your free copy of Paul's award-winning book and receive a roadmap for building both lifestyle and wealth through property investing. Grab your free copy today at purepropertyinvestment.com. Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm joined by Ash Warrior Kasawani. Ash, before the break, we were talking about that second property and renting it out. So by what, April 2021, you had you had tenants in that property, positively geared. Pretty amazing achievement to have turned that around so quickly, I think. Um, especially we, I guess at that time, we did all think we were coming out of the pandemic pretty unscathed, which 
didn't actually happen to be the case, but obviously a lot of positive things going on for you. What was your next thought around what your portfolio would be doing once you got tenants into that property? Yeah, so I was exploring two options really when the tenants moved in that I could I could really buy another house or I could, you know, build a secondary dwelling on the on the Beverly Hills property. So I was exploring, you know, both options and going back and forth that, that which one is most feasible now. So um yeah, at the moment I'm still speaking to the council and you know, trying to get approval for the secondary dwelling at Beverly Hills. And at the same time I'm also in the market to buy, you know, the second, uh, the, yeah, the third property, I guess, somewhere in, you know, in the region and uh, towards the, you know, west and in the Blue Mountains region. Okay. So are these separate plans, is it one or the other, or could it be both that you do pursue? At the moment, like I prefer to buy another property instead. And, you know, if that doesn't go ahead, I'll definitely go with the secondary dwelling. So my priority would be to, uh, you know, I guess get another property and then I could always build a second dwelling, you know, later down the track. Yeah. That's the benefit of land, isn't it? Which you talked about in that last episode and just how valuable you actually see the land compared yeah. to the house. Yeah. That's why when I was buying the Beverly Hills property, I wanted to maximize the land component. So um, that's the advantage of, you know, having a property on a 630 square meter block that it's quite easy to fit the secondary dwelling on that. So you know, even in the future, if, if I don't go ahead with the secondary dwelling now, um, you know, five years down the track, I could easily build another house on that. Yeah. Mm. The market has gone up a lot in the last 12 months. Has that had an impact on your plans for that next property? Because obviously you haven't, you haven't sold the second one. You haven't taken the same strategy you took <laughs> with the first one. So where are you at financially? Are you, um, are you pulling in from the equity? of that second property to go out and buy a third or have you got separate savings? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of both really. I'll be um, pulling in a little bit of money from the second property and um, I've got savings as well that I could use to it the third property. So it's a, it's a bit of both. And um, the kind of property that I'm looking to buy next aren't going to be like as expensive as the Beverly Hills property. So I don't really need as much deposit um, or, or your renovation uh, money. So, yeah. Okay. So, I already know it's out west. What are you looking for in in that next property apart from obviously, you know, high potential for capital growth? Yeah. So, again, I would like to follow the same process and the steps. So, I'm looking for a property with, um, you know, ideally 500, 600 square meter land. So, I could, you know, down the track, build another house at the back of that property somewhere close to the station, you know, close to, you know, schools, you know, public transport and, and things like that. And um, try and, you know, ideally buy 15, 20% under market value. So that gives you a buffer that even if the market was to cool down in the future, uh, you're not really going to have negative equity in that property. That's basically my thought process. Yeah. You pretty much answered my next question there too, Ash, which was going to be, do you have any fears that the property market could go down? Um, it's all anyone's been talking about lately that we could see a bit of a stall. Interest rates could start rising. But do you think that your strategy, you know, is foolproof even if that was the case? I wouldn't say foolproof because any type of investment is a risk and not not having an investment is also a risk. But I guess if you buy something already 20% below market value and have, uh, you know, an uplift in the value because of renovation. So you're already, you know, about 30% odd, you know, doing better than the market. So even if the market was to go down 30%, you still kind of break even. So, um, yeah, that's probably the kind of steps that I would take to uh, protect myself from a downturn. Which feels like some pretty good odds. Yeah, exactly. Like you're not, if you're not buying a property, you're betting against the housing market. But if you buy it, in a, in a responsible manner and, you know, take a calculated risk, then I believe there's still chances of doing good in the future. Good on you. So that brings me to one of my last questions for today, Ash, and it's just around whether your goals for property and what you can achieve from having a portfolio have changed since the last time we spoke that was you would have been you were pretty green then and it was that yep. first property you obviously made a massive profit off the back of it which you could then put into that second property 
Has your thought process, you know, are you still looking for those kind of wins or is it a little bit more mellow? It feels slightly more mellow from my perspective just because um, you've actually you've put tenants in that in that Beverly Hills property instead of just selling it off straight away. But I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so the overall goal to build wealth through through property hasn't changed yet. The only thing that changes is the decisions on a micro level for me that leads to the macro outcome. So, uh, you know, there's a common saying that when in doubt, the zoom out and, you know, understand what's happening uh, in the market. So, yeah, definitely a, a bit more mellow because I've got more involved with, with work and some other uh, personal commitments as well. So my long-term strategy, again, is to, uh, you know, buy properties, again, under market value, have them on rent, uh, you know, I guess they can pay themselves off in the future and, you know, leverage that use equity to buy the next property. I'm not really looking to, you know, flip houses anymore. It's more so a modified strategy of, yeah, buying properties that need work, uh, but, you know, keep them for the long term. That's what my goal is at the moment. You're sounding very wise. How much more knowledge do you feel like you've taken in or education over the last 18 months? Or is it just kind of having done that process now a second time and seeing what works and what doesn't and, and what you want the outcome to be in the end? You know, does that all just play into this knowledge that you keep growing and you keep learning as you as you do it? Like practice makes perfect kind of thing. Yeah, by practice and also, uh, I guess, listening to Smart Property Investment Podcast weekly, basically listen, listen to Phil and, you know, Arjun and people like that. Um, and, uh, you know, just trying to educate yourself constantly about what's happening in the market and how to, you know, interpret uh, economic data and, and the news that's coming out. Um, also, I've been educating myself, you know, in the finance space as well. In the last 18 months, I completed a master's in business, um, you know, in the, in the finance space. So, that really, you know, opens up your, your perspective and how you see finance and, and the decisions that you ch- you take could, you, you know, change your life. Yeah. Congratulations on that. That is a big achievement. And as you said, I'm sure it does, you know, help influence your decision making for the better. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, completing that MBA in finance uh, really got me into, you know, understanding how the economy works, uh, you know, supply and demand and things like that. And also, the banking regulations. Um, so you learn about quite a lot of things by doing that course. So, um, yeah. Ended up being a little bit of an ad for further education here, Ash. And <laughs> <laughs> was that, you know, had you gone into that for career reasons? Like were you expecting to also see, feel like it was helping you in your personal life and what you're doing with the portfolio as well? Yeah, I think definitely it would help me in my property portfolio, but um, also from a work point of view, uh, long term, it would have benefits and, uh, you know, it helps you uh, get to the next level and the level above that. So, yeah, that was the whole reason, you know, behind doing, you know, an MBA in finance, because coming from an engineering point of view, we, you know, sometimes we don't really think about, you know, the finance side and we're all about numbers. Uh, but, you know, when, uh, as I say, if the engineer see, uh, see the dollar next to the number, they don't really understand what's happening. So, yeah, it was definitely good completing that course. Yeah. Well done, Ash. Thank you so much for your time today. You've obviously got to go off to work and you've got other things to do. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time. And I think our listeners will have gotten a lot out of this too. And I can't wait to do this again in another 18 months or so and see what's happened. Yeah, hopefully I'll have more updates um, and you know, get some get some things done in the next 18 months. Yeah, but thanks again for having me on the show. Best of luck with it all. I can't wait to, to keep in touch. To everyone who has listened to this episode, I hope you enjoyed it. Please like or review us on whatever platform you're using to listen in. And if you have any questions for myself, anyone here at the Smart Property Investment team, do not hesitate to reach out at editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. As always, stay up to date with all the latest property news on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au as well as Facebook, Twitter, and our LinkedIn. Until next time, stay safe and well wherever you are tuning in from. Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Looking to refinance your loan for a better rate? 
Maybe you're considering releasing equity to grow your portfolio or struggling to find a lender that can meet your needs. Finney is the investment finance specialist that has the solution. With access to over 70 lenders, Finney can track down the financing solution you need. We specialize in investment property finance and we only deal with lenders that have the right solutions for investors just like you. So you're in safe hands. Fast track your investment strategy today. Visit finney.com.au for more information.